So now we're now we're set. Um, so I hope to see many of you tomorrow. <clears throat> and now for this session, please put your questions and comments in the chat. Um, our NASDAR, who's our new DC Statehood intern, is going to monitor the chat and uh, she'll grab your questions and comments um, so that and read them out for us. Um, so first, to simply get us on the same page, that's what this presentation is all about. It's just to get us all on the same page uh, about DC statehood and also to prepare us for our Hill visit to greet our, the new members of Congress that's taking place on the 23rd. Um, we also hope that some of you will step up and volunteer to be on our speakers team. So I can call on you to use our PowerPoint slides to talk to other groups in the future. So let's jump in. And by the way, I am gonna be reading this because if I don't, I'm gonna go off into, <laughs> into tangents about DC statehood. So let me do that. Uh, let me share my screen. Here we go. I think this is how I change it. Come on. How do I change it? How do I move it forward? That's so weird. <clears throat> Sometimes, Anne, I think you might have to just click your, um, Click it and then it'll turn on and then maybe then you can. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. All right. <laughs> so most of us believe that for a democracy to work for all of us, it must include us all. But today, Americans living in Washington, DC are barred from having an equal voice and voting representation in Congress simply because of where we live. The UN has declared DC's lack of representation in our national legislature a human rights violation. That's really important for us to remember. Um, so, you know, to be very clear, um, we need to move and see where, how we got here. So let's see if we can um, move to a quick poll on DC's history. So, when did DC lose congressional representation? Did we never have it? Was it when the Virginia side went back to Virginia? Was it in 1801? Was it in 1789 when the constitution was adopted? You can put your uh, answers in the chat or you can just keep it to yourself, whatever. Um, I'll give you a couple minutes, but this is part of American history that's not well known. All right, I'm gonna to switch to the next one. It was in 1801. That's when citizens were disenfranchised. So I'm gonna condense, condense more than 200 years of history into a few sentences. So please feel free to ask me more details if you feel you need them. So back in 1801, US citizens, many of whom had fought in the Revolutionary War and were living in DC, were still able to vote in all Maryland and Virginia elections during the 10 years after DC had been established. Then when Congress moved into DC and passed the Organic Act of 1801, that immediately disenfranchised everyone living in DC. So the congressional record back then shows that even back then they were concerned about quote, turning citizens, DC citizens into subjects. So the idea that the founding fathers wanted it this way is not true. So over the years, many arrangements for local government were tried, but Congress continued to exercise total control over DC as described in the constitution. They even reduced the size of the district in 1847. When they sent the Virginia side back to Virginia, that was after the people on the Virginia side voted to retrocede and Virginia voted to receive them. This established the clear precedent that Congress is able to reduce the size of the district. 
They even established a territorial government. That was in 1871. <clears throat> and but when it became clear that there would be many African-American men, women of course did not yet have the right to vote, um, that were elected in DC, among other reasons, Congress changed the arrangement to a presidentially appointed commission, a dictatorial arrangement that lasted for nearly a hundred years. So now we're gonna jump that hundred years to 1964 where we actually had the 23rd Amendment passed that allowed DC citizens to vote for president. So please note that this is about the district being given the right to vote for president. So when Douglas Commonwealth is admitted as a state, it will not any longer have anything to do with the 23rd Amendment, which applies only to the federal district, which will still be under the total control of Congress. So Congress will decide how to manage the three electoral votes that apply to the federal district. And the 23rd Amendment is actually addressed in our bill, our Washington DC Admission Act, making it basically inactive. So it's not a barrier to the admission of the new state. So <clears throat> between 64 and 73, President Johnson started the transition to a more locally based government. And then Congress finally established this limited home rule government in 1973, just like in the 70s, 1870s, they can dissolve it at will. So I wanna point out that in 1964, that was when I moved to DC. And so I've been watching, as far as I'm concerned, the development of democracy, because everybody had to learn how to do this. So, <clears throat> Then we got to 2016 and we voted to petition for statehood. 86% of us voted for that. Um, and we had a new constitution, we established boundaries. And guess what? In 2021 and 2020 and 2021, HR 51 passed twice, passed the house. And S51 was introduced with a record number of original co-sponsors, but it died at the end of the 117th Congress. So in the 118th Congress, which is where we are now, HR 51 and S 51 have once again been, in, it been reintroduced, but given the current polarization, our estimate is that will not come to the floor. So from the very beginning, DC citizens called for full rights and full representation this is a 220 year old fight, 222 year old fight. So our task now is to keep the issue on the front burner. We need to remember that a national poll last year found that 54% of respondents favored DC statehood. So let's see now how things work and how they would work with statehood. So you can see, and on the left side of your map, I think it's left, um, you see the DC map. That's how we currently work. So our eight wards and <clears throat> the, we elect representatives to the DC council along with five at large members. Our mayor functions like a governor with many state and county functions as well as normal municipal tasks. The council passes legislation the mayor signs it, but nothing becomes law until Congress approves, which can take months. Our judges are appointed by the president. With no voting representation in the House and not even a voice in the Senate, we're really cut out of any decision making at the national level. Now, the map on the other side shows the federal district. You can see the federal district there in the white. By the way, the boundaries of the federal district are pretty close to this security zone that was established after the insurrection on January 6th. The capital city that people think of <clears throat> is all going to be encompassed in, by the new federal district. You know, when the eighth graders come to DC to see our nation's capital, they don't come to see my house, nor yours. So 
it's going to be the national government buildings, the monuments, the mall, the monumental core of the district. So this is important. With a federal district still present, we're constitutional because the constitutional says, constitution says there shall be a federal district not to exceed 10 miles square. And Congress has already reduced its size before the Civil War. So the territory where about 700,000 people live will be in the new state. And we know we can become a state with a simple majority vote because that's how all the other states after the first 13 were admitted. So by recognizing DC as a state, we can ensure the full rights and honor the equal freedoms of every American, no matter our color, party, zip code, to make a place where we all have a say in the decisions the effect, that affect our families, communities, and country. So here's another view of <clears throat> our district and the federal enclave that the mayor's office has put together. And I like it because it's an excellent resource. It shows some of the landmarks and national, uh, places of national significance. And it also shows ballparks and you know things like, uh, like things that really matter to us. Um, and, um, you know, Ann, Ann Stauffer, could you, could you break in here for a minute and talk to us about what you've recently used with the neighborhoods? Um, yeah, sure. Actually, yeah. so I recently did a presentation to some college students and I was trying to think about the struggle we have in trying to make people realize that Washington DC isn't just the mall and con dysfunctional Congress and the White House whose occupant you may or may not like, right? So people are always like, oh, DC, you know, the politicians in DC. Blah, blah, blah. So um, I, um, in my presentation, I had a map that was sort of generic, like the generic outline of DC with a couple of the, the national stuff on there. And then I found a map that shows the 131 neighborhoods of DC. So when I flipped to that and I said, well, DC is actually, you know, uh, uh, has a district with 131 neighborhoods, I got an ooh, you know, because I think people kind of really relate to that, right? And it looks like this very colorful quilt, which again, I think it also works in talking about quilt, the quilts project. Um, and then I also talked about like, we have so and so many libraries and schools and farmers markets, because I really think people need to really get a tangible sense that we live here, you know, where it's not just all these, you know, politicians that people love to complain about. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. This these are the kinds of things that we we keep um reorganizing, recreating our our slides uh as we get these new ideas. So one key fact I would like to also highlight is that in the proposed map, and that in the federal enclave, there are no residents living in the retained federal district. And there's no licensed residential housing in that part. So just there isn't anybody living there. Um, so, you know, if you go to the mayor's um, website, you'll be able to find more of these resources. <clears throat> so let's look at what it would mean to be a state. Oh, we don't have enough time to explore all the effects of being a colony of the Congress. But if DC were granted statehood, we would more than likely not have these kinds of things happen to us. So during the years that Congress has prevented our needle exchange program, we ended up with the highest HIV AIDS infection rate in the nation. So it's not like, these are not, you know, the way that Congress manages us is not just on paper. It really affects lives. People lost their lives. And during the few times, the few years where they did not get that rider passed, our infection rate dropped by more than half. So, you know, it really makes a difference. Now, because Congress has control of our local tax dollars, they prevented us from using them to help low-income women who needed um, medical care, abortions. January 6th, our mayor, if our mayor had been a governor, 
She could have called up the National Guard immediately. The DC National Guard is under her supposedly uh, uh, charge, but actually she had to go and ask the president or you know, the Defense Department. And of course, it was slow to arrive and we won't get into that, but you know, that's one of the things that happens. And then it just in the last week, Congress passed a disapproval resolution that nullified DC's revised criminal code. Now, regardless of one's personal opinion about this DC law, duly passed by the DC Council, we who live in DC are entitled to the liberty of self-governance at the local level. This is a clear example of a paternalistic and undemocratic treatment of the people of DC. There also, I wanna be clear that many policies imposed on DC are discriminatory. For the record, the racism that's been displayed over the years is often not subtle. It ranges from microaggressions to intended insults. For instance, in 1967, when our newly appointed mayor commissioner, Walter Washington, submitted his first budget to the House District Committee, Chairman John L. McMillan responded by sending a truckload of watermelons to his office. God. So we have tried many ways to get full rights for DC citizens, and it's become clear that in order to be on an equal footing with the rest of the country, the residential and commercial parts of DC needed to need to be admitted as a state. So let's just talk a little bit about who's working on these things. Because we've been accelerating our momentum. So the voteless League of Women Voters, which is what they called us, or we called ourselves back in 1920, um, works in tandem with the National League the state leagues and local leagues across all 50 states and more than 700 communities. DC statehood is part of the National League of Women Voters policy priorities, which grants us greater latitude to mobilize and outreach with our sister league. So I mentioned that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization, the league that believes that for democracy to work for all of us, it must include us all. I've said that before, I'll say it again. It's something you can say over and over again. The League has been working for full rights for DC citizens since 1938, understanding that lack of representation and local self-government are civil and human rights issues. We don't do this work alone. We have local partners, we have national partners, and we're very much open to collaboration. <clears throat> So a key example of this is the DC Statehood Coalition. It's made up of national and local organizations. Here's just some quick views of, you know, the kinds of things that we've done. Um, one part of our coalition is focused on state legislators putting out resolutions in support of DC Statehood. And I, of course, as soon as I hear from them, then I write to that state. And I just heard from New Mexico letting, who let us know that they had given, um, given testimony supporting DC statehood and, and that it actually had passed the committee that was in. I don't know whether it'll get any further because I don't understand the New Mexico politics, but that's all right. So another example is this Hill visit. And let me just move this forward because you can see these. Other, some other things that we're doing. The DC Statehood Lobby Day or the Hill Visit that DC Vote is organizing on March 23rd. DC Vote does this every two years, except during the pandemic, to welcome new members of Congress and introduce them to the real people of DC. And this is what we've been trying to do with hashtag picture 51 too. <clears throat> So when we meet the new members of Congress who've agreed to meet with us, we'll want to be bringing our personal stories, what kind of work we do, who we are in real life, and be ready to tell them one thing about why DC statehood is important to us personally. So here's how the Hill visit will work. You can sign up for morning, afternoon, or all day. There'll be lunch provided. 
from 12 to one. And we'll be divided up into teams with a captain who will have the information about who your team's gonna be visiting. Your team will have a chance to briefly organize itself for the meeting, which may be with staff who may also be new to DC. So let me point out that since these meetings will be much more personal and relaxed on Thursday, the 23rd Hill visit, it, this visit is a good time to bring along teenagers. So you can register for the Hill visit because NASDAQ is going to put that in the chat. So here's some more things that we've been putting, that we've been trying to put things on, um, keep things on the burner. Um, on the front burner. I've now lost track of where I am. So, um, but you know, we've seen picture 51, we've seen um, postcard mailers, we've seen distributing statehood signs, we've provided frequently asked question sheet. Um, we, you can follow us, hashtag picture 51. Um, and of course, we've also invited quilt makers to participate in the quilt challenge. And you can see a, a part of the quilt challenge, one of the quilts right there in the middle there. Um, and then our petition delivery day, that's what it looked like with Senator Tom Carper of Delaware, who's our original co-sponsor of the Washington DC Admission Act in the Senate. He was accepting the petitions of for DC statehood that were collected from his constituents. And uh, the last one, this colorful mural behind me uh, was colored in during a music festival by participants who chose to help us fill in the spaces with vibrant color depicting the many communities and neighborhoods that make up Washington DC, Washington Douglas Commonwealth. And finally, at the bottom, this is one of our frequent social media posts. We think a picture is worth a thousand words. And so this is one of the ways that opponents try to spread information. It's by talking about the whole of DC. You know, they say, well, no, the Constitution says you can't do that because, because, they're, because DC has to be, you know, a federal enclave, you know, can't be a state. Well, I often say, you're absolutely right. That's absolutely true. If we wanted all of DC to be a state, we couldn't do it, but that's not what we're asking. We're not asking for the whole of DC to become a state, just the parts where we live. So the new state will include the residential and commercial parts where some had 700,000 people live, work, play, worship, serve in the military, on juries, but lack full representation in Congress and full local control of their laws and budget. There will still be a federal district as the map clearly shows. So now we're gonna go to Q and A. And I want to, I want to note that on purpose, I did not include all the arguments against DC statehood. So I'm hoping that you all We'll think about things that your friends and relatives, and colleagues and contacts have said, well, but what about, you know, fill in the blank so that we can talk about how to manage those kinds of things. And I'm gonna start, stop sharing my screen so I can see you all. So there. All right. Oh, we had more people join as we were as I was talking. So thank you all. Welcome. Um, so I'd love to hear what you all think about what people say about well, but you know what about what about such and such? And so if you can unmute yourself, um, and if there were Yes, Barbara. Uh, what about the retrocession argument? Marilyn should just take us back and we should make them take us back, even though I think we think they don't want us, uh, which is probably right. You know, wh where do we go with that? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, it's true 
that if we became part of Maryland, we would then be um, represented by, a, by representatives in, in the House and two senators. Uh, the problem is that no state boundary can be changed without the consent of the state. And back in the 90s, when we had our first um, bill in Congress that actually got to the House floor and died, I mean, it, it did not pass, um, the Maryland legislature was asked, well, would you like to take DC back? And they refused in veto-proof <laughs> majorities no, we do not want DC. And every, I think all but one member of Congress representing Maryland are uh, co-sponsors of the DC statehood bill. So in all kinds of ways, they just, they don't want us. And, you know, it's political because if we joined, then they're, whole politics would be in total uproar. Uh, but there it is, you know, <laughs> that's what happens. So that's what, that's about retrocession. Oh, okay. What else did, did you find others in the, in the chat, Nasdar? <clears throat> no, okay. No, there's nothing in there. Okay, thank you. Other comments or Well, questions? just uh, chiming in again. Um, one uh, thing that I didn't see directly um, dealt with here is that there are many, many uh, laws that are drafted and they say that certain rights or funds or whatever go to states or to residents of states. For instance, the, four, the very important 14th Amendment, when we all you know, love and adore equal justice under the law, absolutely does not apply to residents of the District of Columbia as per the Supreme Court. But even more practically than that, um, could you try and remind me of the example when uh, all the states were getting COVID funds and it was all done on a per capita basis because that's what you know, the administration decided was the fairest thing. And it was lots of lots and lots of dollars, millions and billions. Uh, and they decided it was just going to, we were going to be treated in some other category. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's, let's back out of that for a minute and note that in every session of Congress, probably there's about 500 times it, you know, because lots of bills are passed where they're block grants to the 50 states, da, 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 all of that. And guess what? There's always this little addition and the District of Columbia. And so in more than 500 times, Congress normally treats us as if we were a state. Uh, but when COVID came along, they decided that we actually were territory. And so they lumped us with all the territories and the territories received about $750,000 less than the, they were treated like some, I don't know why, but that's how they did it. Um, and so anyway, we were shorted um, money and um, why I, you know, it's like, does this make any kind of sense? You know, like, wouldn't you think that if Congress were coming to Washington, D.C. and then going out to a restaurant to get something or, you know, going and getting their hair cut or whatever, that you would think that they would want us to be fully protected and get as much support to fight off this pandemic. But no, we got less money because we were treated as a territory at that point. And um, just to bring you fully up to date, the next Congress actually fully funded, brought us back up to the equivalent as if we were a state. So, Anne. Okay, so now that we're talking about federal funding, here's a question we always get from 
from other people and actually DC residents. Our, what's gonna happen to all the special federal money that DC gets? We're gonna lose a lot of money because of statehood. Right. Yeah, that's that's a that's a critical piece because actually there are a lot of people who live in DC who think we still get a federal payment. And historically we have received a federal payment. Uh, one of the th people that um, talked to us during our convention, our conference last year, um, had done a study and she found that there were over years, there were times where Congress said, okay, you're gonna get blank amount of money for federal payment to like, because we can't tax federal properties. And oh, every time when she looked at it, they'd say, well, you're gonna get such and such amount of money and they never made it up to that amount of money. We would get some, but it wouldn't, there wouldn't be, it wouldn't fulfill the, the amount that had been said we would be getting. Um, so now the reality is there is no federal payment. We do not get a federal payment. In fact, we fund ourselves totally and entirely. And the amount that comes from the, from the federal government um, that is, is like, just exactly like other states, we get block grants for transportation, for Medicaid, for other, all of those regular things. And we actually have to get less money than about 22 states. I think that's, I haven't looked at it recently, but the last time I looked, it was 22 states get more money for their budget than we do uh, on an annual basis. So does that, does that take care of, Okay, good. Sharon. Hi. Hi. Um, oh, you have to, you have to. It's the cherry blossoms. blossoms. Um, this is actually, I think, a bit of, of a segue in just in presenting the case. I believe that a lot of folks do not fully understand and appreciate. So, for example, yes, the district had financial struggles and some issues in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And we are not alone. Other states, other large cities have also had certain difficulties. What I feel gets lost sometimes in the discussions and in some of the debates is a recognition that our legislature has passed balanced budgets for over 20 years. We have a reserve as a state, if you will, a state reserve that is well-established and recognized as being, you know, as far as our bond rating is concerned. So I think it's also touting some of the accomplishments that we've had that we write at the ship and to see here's how we manage and it addresses which I have to measure my comments here. What always outrages me is the, you know, just the lying about this city is so mismanaged and that's just not true. So I think having those kinds of talking points coupled with the discussion that Ann Stauffer made earlier about our neighborhoods, you know, people don't think of us as a community. Yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's very that's very useful. And you know, if we really got down into the weeds about how we got into the financial mess that we were, let me just say one thing about that. In 1973, when we were when we got the home rule, the limited home rule bill, Pat, you know, we got our charter. One of the things that we had to take on was an unfunded pension liability which means that everybody, because see, everybody in DC had been a federal worker before we, were, we became a home rule, we got home rule. So all of those federal workers had been in the federal uh, payment, the federal 
retirement fund. And what they did was say, oh, well, it's yours now. So you can, you can take over this, but they didn't include any funds that you know everybody had been paying in, but they just took it. So Marion Barry, which I will, I will bring up his, you know, his name, um, faithfully paid in to our, our retirement fund until we ran out of money because there was no way that we were going to be able to do that given that we had the liability from before. So there it is. Barbara. Yeah, thanks, Ann. Um, I've heard from a few neighbors that um, if we become a state, our local taxes are going to go up. How do you address that? Well, um, first of all, if we become a state, uh, we will be in charge of what we tax ourselves. So it may very well be that our taxes might go up. Um, but we can't tell that that's, that that's necessarily true uh, because we'll have to decide what we can do. One of the things that's really important to realize is that we are going to have to take back our criminal justice system. And so that will cost money to, to actually do that. There, there are people working on that right now who are talking about making it, um, making things different in the going forward so that it costs us less money. And we are already working on um, getting a new, um, a new jail, a new system of incarceration here in DC. So it's hard to tell, but that would be the, that would be the big chunk. That's one of the things that people talk about it was like oh no we're gonna have to take back our justice system because right now it's it's all federalized um but we don't know what it would cost yet there have been some funds some things people that have been working on it but it's not at all clear and by the way we get to decide what our taxes would go whether our taxes would go up or down or whatever so i hope that helps um, Nasdar. Um, I have a question from the chat for you. Um, Angie says, what about the terrible criminal code rewrite as was misrepresented in the press showing how badly run DC is? Why does DC deserve statehood if it's so badly run now? Thank you. So first of all, you know, one of the things that we are subject to and that I think we ran into a buzzsaw of national stuff that happens all the time because people do not have to answer to us. So they can decide whatever it else, whatever seems like useful to take back to their constituents. Oh, I stood up for crime or I stood up for, you know, really good government or I stood up for, you know, because I took care of, you know, whatever the, the moral uh, suasion that they want to use in at home, they can um, they can use what they did to DC with no consequences because we cannot vote them out, um, and so that's one of those things. Now, to come to the the um, crime, the criminal code. Um, the amount of misinformation that was put out about that criminal code was horrendous. There, there, it was, it was, people were just declared it on soft on crime. So let's just take, for one thing, they kept talking about um, reducing the, the, uh, the criminal, reducing the criminal the amount of time you had to spend in jail, can't think of the word right now, for carjacking. Well, what did what did that mean? No. Well, in fact, what they reduced it to was what the, usually what people were getting, as in from 40 years to 
24 years or 28 years if you were using an arm, you know, a, a pistol or some, if you were armed when you tried to carjack. So, you know, it's not like we were soft on crime. And by the way, a number of other ones, of other offenses were raised. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a matter of figuring out how I think we really have to figure out how to message things appropriately so that we can fight back when things are being used against us. So um, I've been seeing pieces of the chat come up and I don't know whether there are other things that need to be addressed. And can I just quickly though piggyback on what you were saying about the the um, decision about how much time someone would serve for carjacking that while we lowered what we previously had to reflect what the general decision or the penalty was issued, we were also still higher than a number of those states and those representatives who were talking about how we were soft on crime and their states had lower sentencing than what was proposed in our bill. Right. I just have to say that. Exactly. And it's the same thing with the needle exchange, you know, that the, there were people who were being all moral about needle exchange in Washington, D.C. when their, their state had implemented needle exchange in order to uh, reduce the in level of infection of HIV AIDS. So, you know, it's, it's really difficult to manage. I have to take deep breaths a lot um, to make, make it clear that I can manage this. <sighs> All right, Barbara. Just a quick question. I happen to uh, run into uh, Reverend Warnock who lives around the corner from me last night as he was getting out of the car. And I actually did yell out, Hello, you know, sir, thank you for your service. Though in my heart, I really wanted to say, why did you sell us down the river? You're the moral core of, you know, the hill. Uh, so, you know, what happens on the 23rd when everybody's walking the walk? Um, are, are we just gonna ask them to say mea culpa? And I didn't wanna, you know, I didn't wanna spend my money uh, countering the 30 second commercials that were gonna put me up like Mike Dukakis and all of that and Willie Horton, which of course is what would have come. Um, you know, really like shame on them, no? Well, you know what? The, um, in fact, the 23rd is not gonna be a time where we get to talk about that. We really don't wanna do that uh, because this is really welcoming people to the neighborhood. And we can't walk in with our like, so you voted against us. This is not gonna make friends and influence people. Um, this. What we're going to do is try to help people understand that, in fact, when they, you know, without having to talk about it, they are the ones who just did this to me. And when I go out to another state and I'm talking about DC statehood, one of the things that is most effective is when I say, so you know, you vote for a congressman, right? And when you go to, will you send the congressman to the Hill? And I never say send them to DC. I send, let's say, send them to Capitol Hill. And they arrive here on Capitol Hill and they're supposed to represent you and they're supposed to carry your messages. And you know what? They're in charge of me. And I don't have any say about what they do to me. And people are like, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, because I live in Washington, DC and I don't have a member of Congress that can vote and I don't have any senators. And so your senators and your congressmen are the people who are in charge of me. And I don't think that's very American. And people are like, yeah, that's not. And that's, that's where we need to keep saying 
you know, this is why we need to keep this on the front burner because people don't understand that out there. Um, so, so Anne, uh, is your hand still up or a hand up again? Uh, it's up again, actually. So um, I'm, I'm curious, I'm gonna actually put Diana Wynn on the spot <laughs> because she is, from what I understand, a communications expert. And you know, many of us who are here on the call are the already converted, but I was just wondering if if she has thoughts about what you've heard or the messaging or, you know. Yeah. I look, um, I I don't have the the magic answer to this. If if there was a great answer where this would solve the problem, you all would have discovered it uh, by now. And certainly Ann Anderson has been working on it since the 1970s would. And, you know, I mean, I think what we all know is that uh, they, what is top of mind with the powers that be in uh, the capital is, you know, potential shifts in power, right? DC gets two senators. Now, I don't know what they're telling you when you walk into their offices as to, you know, my experience is I know why they're voting or not voting for something I support, but they won't say those reasons to me. Uh, you know, I and mean, that's my experience here um, working with my legislature. So I don't, I don't know what are they saying um, to you? I, I, it, you know, it's it's difficult. I mean, you guys have the responses to, I think, the misinformation. And I'm afraid what it's ultimately going to take is um, a super majority in both chambers who see that it is politically advantageous to their party um, before it, 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 it really gains traction. But that, that's my view on it. And I don't live in DC. You know, I'm not a subject matter expert um, on it. So, you know, I think it's about giving the answers that you guys have developed. And, um, and I know it's a long fight, but, you know, remember as women and historically and as the league, we take on fights that that often take many decades before we see that success. So, I mean, I think there's just this, I'm guessing dis, uh, they're disingenuous when they give you reasons for why they're not voting a certain way. And, and that can be hard to overcome when you know what the real reason is. Well, actually we have had people when we've gone up to the Hill we have had people say, well, you know, this just isn't, doesn't really matter to our constituents. They've actually said that to us. It's like, well, you know, if the, if you, if my head, head, so let me tell you a little story about this from the, from the nineties. So back then we had a little crew of people who marched up to the hill and walked in and, you know, handed people a flyer and said, can you please, you know, um, vote for the DC bill. And so we had a guy who was doing that and he went to a Colorado congressman. And in the meantime, totally unbeknownst, I was like, oh, I have some people in Colorado. Let me call them. I had some friends. So I called him up. I said, can you please contact your congressman and tell him that you're interested in statehood and you hope that they'll vote for statehood and da, da, da. And these were good friends and they said, sure. And so uh, in the meantime, our guy had visited this congressman and they're like, well, you know, our constituents and, you know, and they're, you know, I'm sure they're the uh, flyer that they handed them went into file 13. So, but the next week giving, doing another round, um, he went into the same office and just checking in and, you know, and they're like, we have people who are worried about this. Come and tell us about what, you know, and they sat him down and they listened to all of the things that he had to say about DC statehood. And I don't think the Congressman voted for us, but we were given a hearing because my, my people called that Congressman. And that was two people. So, Barbara. 
Um, so we have a couple of our quilters uh, uh, on the call tonight. Thank you so much, Sherry from Colorado. I see Julie here who is now in DC, but when she was our quilter, she was in Florida. And um, and Diana, you, you know, you're, you're the out there in the state land. And I guess I don't <laughs> want to put you on the spot. But no, that's okay. If you have any ideas of how we can rile up these constituents and make them, they all get the moral case, I think, mm -hmm. um, once they hear the stories. And there are so many people, you know, most people have no idea that we don't really have representation and it's even worse yeah. than that. So, so, yeah, so, you know, I lived, um, I, I worked in DC at one point, um, taught as an adjunct professor at UDC. Um, my husband worked at law firms in DC and I lived in College Park for many years. I taught at Prince George's Community College for, for a number of years. Um, I was unaware of uh, DC statehood issues until I moved to, to that area. Um, so while I lived in Maryland, I mean, if you live in Maryland and Virginia in that area, you know, the Washington Post. And so you, you, you learn about, you know, national news is local news, local news, is, it becomes national news. Um, and so I think that um, in terms of getting people's constituents, like in North Carolina, or even in California or Illinois, to care about it, it really is about an education campaign. Um, so it, it, I don't think that Americans are overwhelmingly against statehood. I think that most probably don't have an opinion. They don't know anything about it. And so I, I love that you, you, you reached out to your personal network um, and that person in turn was able to, you know, spark um, a response where uh, an elected official felt like um, they needed to do at least something, even if it wasn't vote for it, but to do something. And when something happens, that's an opportunity for education, right? You know, yeah. if anything happens, even if it, if the results aren't what you get, if anything happens, if there's a, an event, there's a hearing or whatever it is, it, it is an opportunity to then use that as a platform to have a public message. And so, you know, I, and I'll be honest with you, at one point we were looking to, um, we were considering retiring in DC, you know, it was one of the cities and we probably won't, but not for this reason alone. And I wanna make that clear, but it did, it, 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 I was very conscious of the fact that I, I moved to DC um, that, I would lose my voting rights and my, you know, that that's my feeling. And I feel pretty strongly about, you know, uh, my voting rights. And so, you know, I think that when people, uh, if, if they can imagine a decision point um, to get them to empathize, uh, that, you know, that may help. But I really think it is about national education. I would encourage you to use your networks um, through like state league presidents. And I know it wasn't that long ago we had a, a league in, it, was it Maine? I'm not sure which state it was now. Got a letter to the editor published on the issue of, of statehood. I loved when I saw that. Um, we need more of that in, 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 you know, the other 49 states to make it clear to people that DC statehood actually impacts me in North Carolina, right? You know, um, because it, 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 it does impact what happens in Congress if you all get representation. Um, and, and, it, and I think it's important, but, you know, again, I didn't know anything about it until I moved to the area. And this is not something that journalists are covering in, in their states. Um, so, so as a leader in the National League, and I see Sherry over there in my corner, who's a leader in her Colorado chapter and has done all sorts of interesting things. Yeah. You know, if you could sort of help us think through how can we make this for league people who we know care about democracy and do have, you know, networks and all of that, how can we make this go to the top of their list? Because they've got their own local issues and all of that. 
Um, mm -hmm. Is there something that we should be doing to make it simpler for them? Uh, we, we did the quilt project and that really helped stealth education. And by the way, I'm inviting everybody here to join me for the continuation of that project, which is um, a session just like this. We're taking out to PTAs and uh, groups looking at climate change and gun control and mm -hmm. uh, faith communities to talk about how they can use the arts to lift their advocacy. And as a stealth education, we give the example of our uh, quilts for DC statehood, and then they learn about the issue. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking, you know, I, now that we're all getting trained, um, I'm looking for people to join us. And also on the call here is Laura Kuman, and she and I are working on a new, you know, project that will be using the food world to talk about uh, DC statehood by uh, putting together a, a cookbook that would be national based on Laura's work in suffrage. Um, Sherry, you should have her come speak to your group. <laughs> Um, so if, any ideas about how to help lift this issue by people whose, you know, tushies don't sit in DC, uh, cause we know there's no. tushies. Yeah. We, yeah. And, 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 you know, and so I didn't expect to be asked this question, so I haven't thought deeply about it. I came really to get, uh, you know, to get kind of a primer and updated on this. And, you know, the thing that comes to mind is usually, I, I still go back to leverage your league network, right? You have it. Um, and there are 50 state presidents. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, um, but it, it, I mean, it, I don't know how large your committee is um, with, within the league, but I would suggest to you individual outreach to a president is going to be far more effective. And, and, and that, that may take months before a whole team can get through them. But if you can do individual Zoom meeting to talk to them and tell them you need their help, you need their help. Yeah, um, well, Diana, we, we, just to be clear, we have been to 30 states mm -hmm. and, and invariably, uh, and this is where, where I think that the level of education gets so clear. Invariably, when I have, you know, entered a league meeting and in the process of saying hi and chit chat and all, people say to me, so do you live in DC? And they're <laughs> like, and I'm like, yeah, along with 700,000 other people. And, you know, and part of what I'm realizing at them, even as I, they say that is they don't know. Mm -hmm. They can't, they can't picture. I mean, D.C. is the Washington Monument. D.C. is the White House. D.C. is the Capitol. It's not our neighborhoods. And, and I've had, <laughs> there was one place where I was, you know, giving my presentation and I got to some place and somebody in the audience said, but that's not American. <laughs> you know, so there were, there were ways that they were like getting it finally, but it's so clear that it's very difficult to even imagine that we don't have, that we are, I mean, recently I finally learned, even I'm, I'm still learning, I finally learned that it took us a hundred years, DC did not have right to jur trial by jury. DC had to be given the right to trial by jury by the Congress. So there are these kinds of things that I, it just does, it doesn't occur to me, but you know, the reality is that we really are a colony and, and whatever Congress says is what is how Congress goes and how we, how we don't have any way to say back. And when we talk about that and really make it clear, it's really, it really comes, comes home to people. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more that it's about education. And, um, and I think that the personal level is a critical piece. 
And the other thing that I want to just highlight again, because I mentioned it, but one of our coalition, DC Statehood Coalition members is working on the Statehood Compact. And what he does is he reaches out to state legislatures, uh, state legislators to get them to put a resolution for DC statehood. And already there have been more state legislators who have put in those resolutions in multiple states. I've, I've been trying to keep up with him and I'm, I'm behind. <laughs> NASDAQ, I'm behind on this. I, we, need to, we need to work on getting those things out to people. Because what I do is when he sends me a note, it says, okay, the, there's a resolution in Utah or there's a resolution in Missouri or whatever. Then I write to the, to the state league and say, hey, there's a resolution for DC statehood. Can you please provide support for that. And, you know, given that the National League has said, this is a priority, we can, we can do that. Um, and so um, those are the kinds of things. And I think when we have a resolution in a state legislature, it, it has another way of focusing the attention so people can actually have something to do about it. Uh, to support. And like I say, um, I just had somebody from, Nor from New Mexico tell me that she presented uh, testimony in person and, and it passed out of the committee that, that it was in. So, you know, we'll, you know, that, that's, you know, who knows where it's going to go, but it's, a, it's about education. It's about education. Judith. And then Sherry. Hi, thanks, Anne. And thank you, everybody, for all the work you're doing. I was struck by a couple of things. I've lived all over the place. And uh, actually, I should probably uh, get in touch with those the leagues in those uh, places uh, all over the country I've lived. But the thing that struck me with what you were saying, Diane, about uh, considering not to move to D.C. partially anyway because of the lack of a vote. And I remember living in Maryland and all these other states, and I knew that D.C. didn't have uh, representation, and I kind of shrugged it off. So, oh, well, too bad, until I lived here. And it was like, oh, now I know what it feels like. And it's a very, it really was a, a, a aha moment for me. So. I, I one question I will ask people in my network, and we're all at the age or have already of retirement or have retired, is would you move to a place where you had no representation, no voting rights, and then emphasize what that means? You know, don't go into D.C. and it's a city and I like the country. None of that. I mean, that's important, obviously, but. Would you live in a place like that? Would you choose that? Because I know it didn't cross my mind when I came here, and I'm happy I'm here. The other thing is, I think the mention of neighborhoods, and in the, the talk you did, the PowerPoint, you didn't show the individual neighborhoods, but mentioned them. And I think that's powerful. I grew up in a city. I grew up in Chicago, and we I lived in one neighborhood, and, you know, a mile away was another neighborhood, and we even had um, a kind of competition and friendly competition, you know, and everybody took pride in their home neighborhood. And the idea of the people and the, the uh, businesses and we're the life of a city and pointing out that we're not the monuments. I can walk to them if I want, and I love that, but that's not where I live. So thank you for bringing those things up. It really triggered some things for me. Thank you. That really underscores, um, you know, Anne's Ann Stauffer's um, perspective on that. Sherry. Well, first of all, it was totally our privilege to uh, participate in Quilts for DC. And I just gave a little update yesterday at our uh, monthly meeting and mentioned the tireless work 
that Barbara Garlock did in creating that program, in receiving our quilts, in displaying our quilts, having a wonderful presence on their website, on our website. I mean, really, it was just endless and very concentrated, really uh, appreciated uh, approach. And the attachment on that Quilts for DC uh, narrative was excellent. So she had a variety of attachments there that you could go from zero knowledge to lots of knowledge just instantly uh, by hitting those uh, various links. And everyone used that and everyone raised their education level because we were wanting to create something that was within the purview of uh, bringing attention to Boats for DC. So that I gave that just yesterday and invited many of them to join us today um, on this presentation. And then uh, one thing, I was in uh, government for a long time. And one thing that you have to do when you're trying to you know, uh, talk people into stuff is give a monetary value. And so I would love to see what are you saving the government when you have to take back your, uh, your uh, uh, policing? What are you saving the government in anything else that you can, can do? Because that's a powerful statement that someone who is not interested in the altruistic uh, viewpoint may be able to sink their teeth into, if indeed you can save something like that. Then in uh, February, uh, we had a wonderful speaker uh, for uh, African-American History Month, and it's a cross-league situation. So that particular person is a friend of mine, Dr. Annie Beneville. She's the president of Houston, and she was kind enough to speak to us on uh, the U.S. Constitution and voting rights. And so that was a beautiful program, Cross League. So I would highly recommend anything, just like um, Anne uh, uh, was saying, or I'm not sure the name, I'm sorry, but um, the, we already have the system in place. Let's cross league power uh, on, on this particular subject. And then I, you guys may remember, we uh, started an initiative called uh, United We Sit, Divided We Fail. And we brought that to uh, League of Women Voters US. And basically what that was, was writing every league wrote their state uh, senators and their US uh, senators and representatives and suggested that they sit in Congress by someone of another party so that you're starting to you know, have a relationship and possibly have some kind of, you know, dinner plans or whatever, you know, something that goes beyond this constant uh, barrage of that is, is just so inundated in the press. And then um, successes, absolutely. I would, I would just send that out wherever you can. Those, those successes are huge, you know, to, to refute any of these misinformations, you know, like uh, saying, oh, you know, they were in a financial trouble a long time ago. No, what um, the other lady said was uh, they, they made a turnaround and they have had 20 years of balanced budget. That's powerful stuff. So those kinds of things are really neat to, and I'm really excited about the fact that you're using, you know, league is, we're crafters. And you know, for the whole entire history of our world, it's, it's this gentle approach. And I love the fact that Quilts for DC is going to expand that into, or, or you know, I'm, I'm probably misstating it, but uh, into other uh, venues. But I would, that's what I would do with, um, with um, Quilts for DC, or not Quilts for DC, I'm sorry, uh, all the DC uh, types of things that we're trying to uh, work with. Also, I'm an avid gamer, uh, board gamer, and there's a wonderful board game called um, Wreck the Nation, and it was done by two senators uh, a while back, and, you know, it's just really cool, and then um, there's one called Wingspan, and Wingspan is very, um, Wreck the Nation is super political. Wingspan is uh, ornithog or ornithology, and it is by a DC gamer that is also an ornithologist. So what about the idea of developing some kind of DC game? Uh, we're talking about a board game now. I'm not interested in uh, video games, but a board game 
and, um, and, you know, talk about this stuff, get it on a board that people could, the, the industry, the gaming industry right now is a multi-billion dollar industry. You could make some money, you could bring, I mean, if it hits, you, you, it's just, it goes viral like that. So anyway, that's, I think that'd be so cool to work on a board game that brought forward a lot of these types of things. And, you know, it's fun to play board games. And when you're playing a board game about uh, DC statehood, that's killer cool. And I would absolutely work on that in a flat second. I even have blank boards ready to go. And I'm an artist. <laughs> Cherry. This is dangerous. You are on. Guess what? You, you know, can go visit your daughter also. You know that, <laughs> you. that my brother and my son and I um, made a game about the Iran Contra issue. Oh. I still have it. You know what? I'll send you a copy. So, Very cool. So, we can do this. We can. I I'm, mean, you are that, you. You have her email, right, Barbara? <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's. I see Diane. Diana again has her hand up. Yeah, just a, a comment as I was listening um, to the the last uh, couple speak. I and, and, and Sherry, I think, has brilliant ideas. I loved your quilts for DC project and the way you could spin that in into a, um, a messaging campaign um, and fundraising. I mean, it it it, it had. Uh, lots of purposes, and I think that it, it's a model for other leagues on other issues. But what I would add, you know, you, what you have is largely in your toolkit. The, mostly, the facts are on your side on this issue. And and my experience in the league is, you know, we tend to be women who are very analytical thinkers, and we collect facts. And so Sherry's right, you know. Um, Make sure we're also touting our successes and in that toolkit should be the economics of it. But um, what we also need to remember is the power of storytelling when we're educating and persuading people um, and that you, you want all those facts, but you want to read the audience in front of you. By audience, I mean, it could be a whole room full or it could be a single person um, and and stories. Um, from different kinds of people in DC who have different lived experiences, those who were born and raised in DC um, and have never had representation like I have in, in my state, those who relocated to DC and, and are stunned to learn what the difference is and the things that they took for granted when you get representation. So you get the idea that you, you could collect and craft stories that demonstrate a lot of your facts. They're not they're not disconnected from the facts, but but um, but they come packaged in the form of personal stories by those who are living in in DC with different experiences. How does it affect me that I don't live in in a an area uh, in this nation that's recognized as a state um, and and again, I think that could be very powerful. So that I just wanted to, as I was thinking about that, make sure that I mentioned the power of collecting and crafting stories is part of what's in your toolkit. Well, just a, just a little note on that. We're on our third book here in Gunnison. And uh, so we've already published three books and they are exactly that. They are historic stories about uh, suffragettes uh, they are uh, stories about, for instance, uh, Phil Weiser, who is our current attorney general, was the uh, law clerk for uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So we have stories like that. He talks about working as a, a clerk for her, all these personal pictures, that sort of thing. Articles that we've written are in there. And so, you know, there's three of those and we've already accomplished that since like 2020, I think, maybe 2019. So that story thing that you're talking about could be a lovely book that uh, could come out of whoever is actually sponsoring it. And it's all about 
just uh, editing it into something and getting it uh, on, um, well, basically we used Amazon. And um, it's not the greatest, but you know, it, they're, they're out there and we have them printed off and we sell them all the time. Cool, cool. Sharon. Thank you. I, I was, I've been listening to all of this conversation, particularly the part about um, the storytelling and also giving people facts about the District of Columbia. And so the part that I'm hearkening back to is that I've worked for the District of Columbia government before. And in, um, I've actually had several stints in DC government in the early 2000s, I was working in the mayor's office and at that time, we were, he was um, president of the National League of Cities, which is an association that represents municipalities and towns and cities across the country. And during his tenure, when he would visit the various state leagues, he would talk about the point that was being made earlier about neighborhoods. And, and I'm just looking at the projectory, uh, the projection, if you will, because this particularly I was traveling with him in 2005 as a staff person and how he was telling people then, DC is more than monuments. You need to go out and see the city. You need to see the people who live here. And when he hosted the league's board of um, board and some other visitors, he organized a bus trip to take them out to the neighborhood. So it's it's that continuity that I think we're we're having to kind of struggle through to keep that thread for folks to understand that it's not just the mall where people step out and visit and that they've not seen, you know, they've seen very little of Washington, DC. I, I also bristle when people talk about, yeah, Washington DC, those people, it's like, no, 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 that's not me. You should say Congress, cause that's not me. And then um, the other thing, when we were talking about storytelling, which I think is, is persuasive, is to point out to people what, how the District of Columbia government and the DC residents and taxpayers support the federal government. If you look at anybody's motorcade, a visitor, an ambassador, any function, you will see cars from the municipal, you know, the DC police department. We are responsible for things like security. People don't understand that folks come into the city, earn their income, and unlike any other jurisdiction, they don't pay taxes on their earned income in the place where they earn it. And so I just, you know, I, I'm not saying this is all coherent. I'm emotional right now, so I'll own it. But I think part of that is also the truth telling that we have to do. And it's a reason why our tags, our car tags say, you know, representation without ta taxation without representation. And, and I think for some people too, reading the audience as was mentioned earlier, I think for some people that's also very persuasive because it is so unfair. Thank you. I'll stop now. Yay, Sharon. Thank you very much. That's lovely. That's lovely. So I am very aware that we are coming to um, 7.56 is what my, my computer says. And we said we would stop at eight. So I'm open to any last comments. And, um, and I really appreciate this this whole discussion, I feel like I've been taking notes fast um, on various things and it's, they, it's been a wonderful sharing. So anybody else wanna say anything? And I see Abby, thanks to you for being here. I wanna thank uh, the quilters who came and, and all of you, um, and we'll be reaching out to you with different opportunities to step up just a little bit with your connections and your contacts. As I said, Laura and I are working on a cookbook. We wanna involve all the leagues all over the country in that, so that you know everybody in the country can understand that there's broad support for DC statehood out there. And you know they can use it to cook delicious things. <laughs> Made yep. by celebrities. <laughs> uh, let me know. Reach out. 
I have someone here in North Carolina who might be a good contact for that cookbook. Okay. Thank you, Diana. Reach out to me. Okay. Fabulous. Fabulous. So thank you all for joining here. I'm totally delighted. And, you know, just so you know, this is a 51 star flag behind me. So just so in case anybody was worried about what the flag would look like. Have a good evening for the rest of the evening. I'm going to go get some tea. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. And thank you.